Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Partha Dasgupta to tell us about his review. Following his speech, we will have a question and answer session for which we're very grateful to Fiona Reynolds for chairing. To ask a question, please use the Slido box on the page for this event on the Royal Society website. And please let us know where you are asking your question from. Partha, it's now over to you. Thank you, Venki. And thank you, my colleagues at the Royal Society for hosting this event. I'm extremely grateful to His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the Prime Minister, and the Secretary of State for the Environment for their messages of support. We are all one of one mind on our place in nature, and that matters most especially today. And I thank the UK government for not only asking me to prepare the review, but also for assembling an exceptional team to help me think through the maze that is the economics of biodiversity. Not so long ago, the economic questions requiring urgent attention could be studied by excluding nature from formal economic reasoning. At the end of the Second World War, with absolute poverty endemic in much of Africa, Asia and Latin America, and with Europe in need of reconstruction, it made sense to focus on the accumulation of produced capital, that is roads, buildings, ports, machines, and human capital, health and education, Unfortunately, the resulting macroeconomic models of growth and development so directed the way academic economists and economic policymakers collect and analyze data, forecast trajectories, design policy, and conceive our economic possibilities, that we have over time come to imagine that we can bypass nature in our economic lives. That belief has been strengthened by the fact that the average person today enjoys a far higher income, is less likely to be in absolute poverty, and lives significantly longer than she did even 70 years ago. The world economy has grown 15 folds since then. So it would seem we are living in the very best of times. But nature is an asset. We are embedded in nature. It is our home and it provides us with a multitude of services we take for granted, such as regulating climate, cleansing our water, decomposing our waste, and fixing nitrogen. But even while we have enjoyed the fruits of economic growth, the demand we have made of nature's goods and services has for some decades exceeded her ability to supply them on a sustainable basis. Because the difference between demand and su sustainable supply is met by a diminution of nature, the gap has been increasing, threatening our descendants' lives. One prominent reason for the increase in that gap between demand and supply is an absence of institutions for creating necessary incentives to economize on our use of nature's fundamental services. The open seas, for example, are used for traffic and are harvested for fish, and yet we are not charged for their use. Worse, governments subsidize the use of nature to the extent of some four to six trillion US dollars annually. In effect, we pay ourselves to eat into nature. In my review, Nature is studied in relation to the many other assets we hold in our portfolios, such as the vehicles we use for transport, the homes in which we live, and the machines and equipment that furnish our offices and factories. But like education and health, nature is more than a mere economic good. So we should think of assets as durable entities that not only have what economists call use value, but may also have intrinsic worth. Once we make that as an extension, the economics of biodiversity becomes a study in portfolio management. That should be easy to understand, for we are all asset managers pretty much all the time, whether as farmers or fishers, foresters or miners, households or companies, governments or communities, 
we manage the assets to which we have access in line with our motivations as best as we can. But because nature is underpriced in our day-to-day -day life, the best each of us is able to achieve with our portfolios may nevertheless result in a massive collective failure to manage the global portfolio of all our assets. The gap between demand and supply I spoke of just now can be likened to a crowd of people trying to keep balance on a hanging bridge and bringing it crashing down. Biodiversity is the diversity of life. Just as diversity within a portfolio of financial assets reduces risk and uncertainty, diversity within a portfolio of natural assets increases nature's resilience in withstanding shocks. At the global level, climate change and COVID-19 are striking expressions of nature's loss of resilience. But small communities have been experiencing loss of resilience in their local systems for a long while, and they're doing so even now. It would seem then that we are living not only in the best of times, a fact we I observed a few minutes ago, but also in the worst of times, because we are putting our descendants in peril. The review demonstrates that in order to judge whether the path of economic development we choose to follow is sustainable, nations need to adopt a system of economic accounts that records an inclusive measure of their wealth. The qualifier inclusive says that wealth includes nature as an asset. The contemporary practice of using gross domestic product or GDP to judge economic performance is based on a faulty application of economics. GDP is a flow, so many market dollars of output per year. In contrast to economic wealth, inclusive wealth, which is a stock, it is the social worth of the economy's entire portfolio of assets. Relatedly, GDP does not include the depreciation of assets, for example, the degradation of the natural environment. As a measure of economic activity, GDP is indispensable in short-run macroeconomic analysis and management, but it is wholly unsuitable for appraising investment projects and identifying sustainable development. Nor was GDP intended by economists who fashioned it to be so used for those purposes. An economy could record a high rate of growth of GDP by depreciating its assets, but one would not know that from the national statistics. The review finds that in recent decades, eroding natural capital or nature has been precisely the means the world economy has deployed for enjoying what is routinely, routinely celebrated as economic growth. Acknowledgement that by economic progress, we should mean growth in inclusive wealth brings the review back full circle to where it begins, 500 pages before that is, which is that just as the private investor manages his portfolio with an eye on the market, on its market value, the citizen investor will want to appraise the portfolio of global assets with an eye on their social worth. Wealth maximization in its various guises unites economic reasoning in all its forms. The review makes use of this unification to develop the idea of sustainable development. It constructs a grammar for understanding our engagements with nature, what we take from it, how we transform what we take from it and return to it, why and how in recent decades we have disrupted nature's processes to the detriment of our own and our descendants' lives and what we can do to change the direction. What then should be done to direct humanity to a sustainable mode of living? Reducing the gap between what we demand of nature and what nature is able to supply on a sustainable basis requires that we reduce our demand and help to increase nature's supply. It will require measured but transformative change for the task is to so change individual incentives that they direct the choice of our actions to align with actions that promote the common good. The change will have to be underpinned by levels of ambition 
coordination and political zeal akin to, but even greater than those of the Marshall Plan. It will require changes in our institutions and practices at not only the national level, but also at the transnational level and at the level of communities and civil society, and closer still, at the level of the individual person. Investment in nature is a route to increasing nature supply. It can take many forms. Technological innovations and sustainable food production systems can decrease the sector's contribution to climate change and change in the way land is used. Expanding and improving the management of protected areas has an essential role to play. Nature-based solutions to protect and restore have been found not only to be employment generating, but to help also reduce the risks companies face in the functioning of their supply chains. The review points to numerous examples where this is happening. As part of fiscal stimulus packages in the wake of COVID-19, investment in natural capital has the potential for quick returns. Natural capital forms the bulk of wealth in low-income countries, and those on low incomes tend to rely more directly on nature. Conserving and restoring our natural assets also contributes to alleviating poverty. So we now need supranational institutions to monitor and administer the global commons, such as the high seas. The rents that could be collected for their use could in turn be used to pay for the protection of global public goods that are housed within national jurisdiction, such as tropical rainforests. And we would save resources if governments were able to eliminate the massive subsidies they offer people to eat into nature. It is less costly to conserve nature than to restore it once, once it is damaged or degraded. In the face of significant risk and uncertainty about the consequences of degrading ecosystems, there is a strong economic rationale for quantity restrictions over pricing mechanisms. An insistence by consumers that firms disclose conditions along their entire supply chain would ultimately reduce the risks those firms face in their profits. Disclosure serves as a substitute for incompleteness of the prices for risk. The total demand we make of nature's goods and services is affected not only by our average little living standard, but also by our numbers. Influencing the two will also involve changes in institution design and practices. The national level offers a number of avenues for reducing our demand increasing community civil society partnerships with government so as to reduce help reduce consumption waste in rich countries and investing in family planning and reproductive health services in the world's poorest countries should be a priority in the uk more than a third of our food is wasted from source to sink and more than 200 million women in the world's poorest countries have expressed an unmet need for modern family planning services to put it bluntly, food in the aggregate is too cheap in rich societies, while a EU budget of less than 1% of development aid directed at family planning is thoughtless. Fortunately, contrary to contemporary economic thinking, we humans are not only not entirely egocentric, we are also socially embedded. The costs of change, if they're shared, are likely to be a lot less than if they were perceived to be incurred individually. But nature has three properties that make the economics of biodiversity markedly different from the economics that informs our intuitions about the character of produced capital. Many of the processes that shape our natural world are mobile, silent, and invisible. The soils are a seat of a bewildering number of processes with all three attributes. Taken together, the attributes are the reason it is not possible to trace very many of the harms inflicted on nature and by extension on humanity to very many of the harms uh, to those who are responsible. Just who is responsible for a particular harm is often neither observable nor verifiable. No social mechanism can meet this problem in its entirety, meaning that no institution can be devised to enforce socially responsible conduct. It would seem then that ultimately, we each have to serve as judge and jury for our own actions. And that cannot happen 
unless we develop an affection for nature and its processes. And that affection can flourish only if we each develop an appreciation of nature's workings. The review ends with a plea that our education systems should introduce nature studies from the earliest stages of our lives and revisit them in the years we spend in secondary and tertiary education. The conclusion we should draw from this is unmistakable. If we care about our common future and the common future of our descendants, we should all in part be naturalists. Thank you. <laughs>